watching Prime Time. I'm Tamanna Inanda. And my name is Ayush Alavadi. Let's have a look at today's headlines. Punjab National Bank detects an 11,000 crore rupee fraud related to jewellers Nirav Modi and Gitanjali Gems. Bloomberg Quinn learns that Modi had told bankers he'll repay any over, overdue loans by selling his Firestone diamond brand. It's a weak third quarter for Sun Pharma. Profit falls 75% on one time, uh, time tax payout and weak performance of its Israeli subsidiary Taro Pharma. Ultratech Cement and a consortium led by Dalmia Bharat emerge as frontrunners to buy Binani Cement. That's a Bloomberg exclusive. RBI's overhaul of the bad loan framework sends banking stocks lower. The Nifty drops to 10,500. PTM Mall takes a cue from Alibaba. Plans to open a brick and mortar store in New Delhi. U.S. retail inflation rose by more than uh, projected in January as apparel costs jumped the most in nearly three, three decades. U.S. stocks and treasuries tumbled. Well, straight on to the top story of the day. Punjab National Bank is at the center of one of the largest frauds to be detected across the Indian banking sector. Uh, PNB said that it has detected some fraudulent and unauthorized transactions. And based on these transactions, other banks appear to have advanced money to customers overseas. The quantum of such transactions is $1.77 billion. Uh, this is what the bank disclosed in an exchange filing. Now the fraudulent transactions are allegedly linked to designer and jeweler Nirav Modi against whom a complaint has been filed with the Central Bureau of Investigation. Vishwanath Nair joins us to tell us how these fraudulent transactions were conducted in the first place. Vishy? Uh, right, so this is essentially the modus operandi of, of how exactly these transactions went through. Uh, the first part of the transaction involves uh, these borrowers who are Nirav Modi and some associated parties, uh, them going to the, the Brady House branch uh, in Mumbai of uh, Punjab National Bank and seeking a letter of uh, undertaking. Uh, the letter of undertaking is essentially a promise that uh, Punjab National Bank gives to some of the foreign lenders saying that this is a good borrower. In case this borrower defaults, uh, we will pay you back. Uh, once they've received uh, that LOU, the foreign bank will approve buyer's credit. This is essentially the money that uh, a company takes so that they can buy raw materials and then uh, start creating their product. So once they have uh, approved that buyer's credit, the amount gets uh, credited to the PNB uh, Nostro account. Uh, so remember, the money does not actually reach any of these borrowers. It essentially remains in this Nostro account and then gets paid out uh, to the supplier, whoever is supplying these raw materials to uh, the company and then once uh, the supplier gets it and the raw materials are transferred the uh, the person who's uh, borrowing all this money will finish their product they will export these products they will get whatever their receivables are from these exports and then they will pay back the foreign bankers essentially the difference is that you uh, get money from the from a foreign banker then you pay them back using the export receivables and then you clear the transaction uh, the problem here is and the the whole fraud here is that when they receive these LOUs, they did not have uh, necessary documents or necessary sanction of credit. Uh, what has come out of the FIR is that uh, the uh, companies tried to get uh, these loans but did not have any sanction limit from the bank. Uh, neither did they have any uh, kind of deposit or long-standing relationship with the bank, which are both required uh, whenever they want to get any LOUs. Uh, there has been a statement now from uh, Nirav Modi, uh, Vishwanath. What is he saying after the story has broken? Uh, so what has happened is that he's written to the uh, managing directors across uh, banks, whoever have exposures uh, to his companies. Uh, Nirav Modi claims that uh, this is uh, this is an issue that he's been facing. Uh, uh, that Bank of Baroda, Bank of uh, uh, Punjab National Bank has not been helping him. Uh, it's a relationship that he's been maintaining for the seven, last seven or eight years, and that he needs more time, and that he will be able to to repay uh, the bankers. How does he intend to repay it? Well, he wants to sell uh, Firestar Diamonds, which is one of his flagship uh, brands. He will sell it and raise uh, closer to 6,000, 6,500 6, crore, uh, which he will use to pay back whoever these bankers are.
Right. Uh, thank you so much for that, Vishwanath Nair, explaining uh, this story and how this fraud actually unfolded. But Banking Secretary Rajiv Kumar confirmed that the transactions relate to designer Nirav Modi and Gitanjali Gems. Speaking to Bloomberg Quince, Nikon Jory, he also said that two fraud letters of undertaking were issued by PNB branch manager in Mumbai. There's Nikon with all of those details. According to Banking Secretary Mr. Rajiv Kumar, the PNB case dates back to 2011 where two fraud uh, letter of undertakings were issued by the uh, PNB branch manager in Mumbai and these cases relate to Nirav Modi and the Gitanjali Gems case. Uh, this according to Banking Secretary Mr. Rajiv Kumar is a part of cleanup exercise undertaken by Punjab National Bank and the case is currently with CBI and about 10 Punjab National Bank officials have been suspended. According to Rajiv Kumar, uh, uh, the government would do whatever it takes to clean up uh, banks and will not tolerate any fraudulent activities. He added that this is uh, uh, this is this mo this this is essentially a step towards uh, 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 towards rewarding the honest and putting an end to fraudulent activities. All right, Tarun Bhatia, MD Investigations and Disputes for Asia Pacific Region at Kroll joins us now uh, in our Mumbai studios. Uh, Tarun, thank you for speaking with us. Welcome to the show. Explain to us how a fraud of this magnitude took place in one branch undetected for seven years. How can something of this scale happen? 11,300 crores. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, part of it is uh, also a relook in the PR initiative of the banks. I, uh, what one needs to understand is I don't think it's one block of 11,000 crore yeah. that is being made out. Yeah, it's over uh, seven This years. is a cumulative amount. So the net outstanding, uh, which could be either under risk yes. or where the borrower is unable to pay, that amount has not uh, as such been specified. I expect that number to be much lower, especially given this industry, it works on uh, short-term credit. Uh, I think what this uh, signifies, because it's happened only in one branch, is uh, how easily a fraud can take place in uh, you know a, a very large system uh, where controls clearly have been breached. So it, it's not surprising in itself. This is not the first time it has happened. But what it clearly indicates is somebody in the system knows how a bank operates, what gets checked, what doesn't get checked, hmm. and hence has made use of it. It has continued, as I understand, after one of the perpetrators has actually retired, yeah. and still the process has, uh, you know, continued. Uh, our sense, given you know the the statement for the request in January, which was around 250 crore, uh, you could believe that this could be over 50 to 100 transactions which could have taken place over this time. So, you know, we're talking about seven years, 100 transactions may not be that many. So clearly it's been a process that has been managed and it can be done by one person. But Tarun, you know, the way you're mentioning it and, and Tamana's question as well, that, that this was being, this was perpetuated, this was happening over some time, but also at the branch manager level. You know, that's, that's to show that the fraud was, well, the cause of action was really at the branch manager level. And, and the modus operandi that, you know, Vishwanath right. was explaining earlier, when it comes to these LOUs being issued, is that a, is that a very shocking revelation and, and could this be part of a much bigger problem with Indian banks? Yes, so I think the concern is one issue has come to the fore. Does that mean that's the only issue? Mm -hmm. My view is may not be. There could be other issues. I think it's also important to understand how the process works. A branch manager is a fairly senior guy right. yeah. in a banking system. I mean, fairly strong authority, especially in a Bombay circle where, you know, the limits that you have yeah. could be as high as a CEO of a small bank could have. Right. So I think that's the kind of power. I think what this signifies and the entire NPA problem in India signifies is clearly there is no accountability. So as a branch manager or as somebody in the branch, uh, you know, a giving letter of undertakings is a very straightforward process and actually it doesn't need too many uh, other stakeholders. I think the key question was if an account was growing in size mm -hmm. or in number of transactions today with use of technology, with awareness that the bank processes have, that should have come to the fore that why somebody, especially in a sector which is right now red flagged, yeah. coming so frequently and you do the diligence, you confirm that it's all okay, great. But if you would have done that diligence the fifth time, the tenth time, then you would have realized 
there is no paperwork. So let me just put it out there. Uh, we do not know yet, but an FIR has been uh, filed against uh, some uh, officers in the bank uh, on the basis of misusing their position as public servants. Um, will there be down the line possibly an element of bribery, corruption, which will be unearthed? Uh, finally, one has to see why this branch manager or the set of employees were showing such largesse to a particular set of companies. Yes, so you know, it's like any action has to be backed by consideration. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's an element of bribery or corruption. I think in these cases, the company which has borrowed money could easily say that I was not aware of the process. I came with a request, the bank followed it. Uh, so to that extent, they may be right. But clearly, there would have been some understanding uh, with the employees in instances like this. It cannot go unnoticed or it cannot be without a consideration because the employees know what kind of risks they are taking. They know that they can manage it, but if there's no monetary benefit or benefit of kind involved, then it's unlikely such events would take. You know, the reason I ask that is because it, it brings me to my next question. Uh, right now, in how much trouble, for example, um, are Nirav Modi and Co. and the proprietors of all of those companies? Because if they have received these letters from the branch, um, can they say that, well, we did not know anything was wrong? We asked for these letters and we got them. Yeah, so I think as it unfolds what will happen is you may hear multiple sides of the story yes so there's a story from the management this is true for any fraud there would be a story from the suspect which in this case would be bank employees there would be stories from the second suspects which are the borrowers and there would be stories from the uh, counterparty banks because they are the ones who finally took the actual exposure uh, so i think anything any statements that each party makes uh, whether it gets corroborated or not is you know in the true investigative sense i think that will come out but uh, we have done very similar investigations globally uh, typically you know uh, one it once it gets unearthed you can go to the bottom of it and you can actually realize where it started what kind of escalated it and in such cases generally multiple parties are involved but tarun you made an interesting point a short while earlier you said Considering you know how technology has has grown, has you know made its advent leaps and bounds, and something like this should have been brought to the fore. Even in this case, if we look at these LOUs, these uh, ostensibly uh, fraudulent LOUs being transmitted through the Swift messaging system, right. we're talking about some level of transparency there. Considering that you know a lot of banks uh, have their digital game uh, you know well in place and put together, and. You know, now we're talking about technologies like blockchain, right? Where everything is transparent, right. where everything is out there for everyone to see. If, I, you know, my natural question would have been, is technology the answer? Or is this more from the policy standpoint that we have to be looking at a case like this? Sure. So, I mean, see, technology can always be only an enabler. It is a failure of process and people. Uh, but, you know, you'll hear now a lot of things that banks talk about, you know, red flags, early warning yeah. systems. The challenge, what this to me signifies, which is very common to, again, the NPA problem, in good times, mm -hmm. the checks and balances go down, whereas it has to be the other way around. So as you're growing, I mean, the sector was flourishing in that period, so was real estate. As somebody came for your second uh, credit requirement in 15 days, that's a red flag which you need to resolve. You cannot feel thrilled about it that I've got a customer who comes to me every 15 days is paying me extra basis point. So the system should not only look for extremes, they should also look for changes in behavior. And yeah. behavior could be, you know, your transaction pattern. And anti-money laundering globally really spends more time on transaction monitoring and not just True. KYC. Our processes are much more KYC-led sure. across yeah. financial products, not monitoring the transactions. If your KYC is clean, but you do a transaction every day, that's a red flag because nobody banks on a daily basis. That's where the processes are filled. So you're right, technology can only help you get yeah. there faster, but you still need to implement the process. Yeah, uh, you know, this, this entire uh, story has unfolded between 2010 and 2017. And when you're talking about the environment we are in, uh, we have now over the last three, four years, um, especially been very focused on cleaning up the banking system on NPAs, on you know crony capitalism and all of those issues. But this continued undeterred even in this environment you know that raises a question right so i think uh, a key question which is still unanswered and partially gets talked about in you know the affidavit also is that there was a requirement which came and this time somebody wanted to follow the entire process and that's yes. where it got caught 
I think there has to be much more digging which needs to be done there as to how something like this happened. But I come back to my first response. In a large branch, uh, see aspects like Swift and all, you know, they are still where you use technology, but uh, they are not forging, uh, creating their own documents. Yeah. What they have done is without anybody's awareness, they've given a loan which maybe the system would have otherwise rejected. It was at a number which the branch manager themselves could have approved. Maybe there are more people involved. Yeah. Uh, so we also don't know whether this came to light only in January or it came to the light earlier and there was investigation done and once somebody yeah. realized the scale of it, it's out there. So those lot of those things are, you know, unanswered and I think as CBI also gets into it, they will, well, they will go on it's, that it's, it's a story we'll be tracking over the next few days. Thank you so much, Tarun, for joining us. My this pleasure. Evening. Well, moving on, the Reserve Bank of India released a new overarching framework for bad loan resolution. The new rules effectively put an end to most of the other stressed asset schemes introduced before India had a bankruptcy code in place. The new rules also put a strict timeline of 180 days on the resolution process. Now we'll be talking more on that story on primetime debate uh, tonight uh, where we will be asking whether the banking system can actually swallow that bitter pill. Krishnamurti Subramaniam, Associate Professor of uh, Finance at the Indian School of Business uh, will be joining us as will independent banking analyst Himendra Hazare and of course we'll also be speaking with KC Chakravarti, former Deputy Governor of the RBI. Well, moving on to the cop, top corporate earnings of the day. It was a weak third quarter for Sun Pharma. The Pharma major has seen its profits fall by a whopping 75%. Darshan Mehta sums up the key takeaways from Sun Pharma's quarterly performance. Okay, so the final Nifty company to report numbers today, Sun Pharma, weak set of numbers. The first factor that we need to watch out is the fact that there was this 513 crore additional US tax outgo and that actually dented the bottom line of the company. Now, revenues were below what uh, the estimates was given the fact that the US sales were down almost 35% and uh, the India sales, rest of the world sales and the European sales, they moved only in a single digit. Apart from it, uh, the margins came in line with what we were anticipating, the EBITDA slightly below. The other factor that we need to watch out is that the tarot numbers were already out earlier and they were extremely weak and they have weighed in on the financials of Sun Pharma. On the US business itself, you know, there were a couple of products which uh, Sun Pharma faced immense competition and that weighed in on their US business. The commentary not the most encouraging. The other fact is that the other operating income was much lower this time around and that also dented the top line of the company. Apart from it, uh, the management uh, view on what is happening with Halol that's extremely important uh, to know the f future movement of what Sun Pharma expects because the Halol inspection is currently on and that outcome is extremely important because Halol f forms a substantial chunk for Sun Pharma's revenues going ahead because they have a lot of filing from them. But overall, if you take the financials into consideration, it's a weak quarter for Sun Pharma this time around. Now on to a Bloomberg exclusive, Kumar Mangalam Birla and an investor group led by Dalmea Bharat are emerging as the lead bidders for Binani Cement. Each bidder has made cash offers of around 60 billion rupees. George Smith Alexander gets us the latest in this report. So what is happening at this point of time is on Monday the uh, the bidders have put in the bids again. These are six bidders who have rebid again. This is the final bid unlike earlier where bidders put in bids for specific assets. They have been told specifically that this time around it will be for the whole company. From what we know about it is that Ultratech and Dalmia Bharat uh, are the two uh, lead bidders for this. JSW also has put in, uh, uh, put in an aggressive bid. Uh, but what we understand is both Ultratech and, and Dalmia Bharat have put in bids of around 6,000 uh, 6, crores. Well, a week close to the day on the Lyle Street, both the Nifty and the Sensex ended with losses. Banks dragged both the indices down. Yes Bank, SBI and Axis Bank incurred sharp cuts, while Tech Mahindra, India Bulls Housing and Bharati Airtel were the top gainers. Now, uh, Indian online shopping site Paytm Mall is uh, set to offer an offline shopping experience as well. Paytm uh, Mall will open uh, stores uh, in New Delhi and wants to open 50 uh, over the next few months. This is an effort to use physical retail to boost its online business where customers can walk in, sca scan the barcodes on products and uh, make purchases from Paytm's mobile app. Uh, but let's uh, go across uh, to the COO of the operation, Amit Sinha, uh, to actually tell us more 
about how this uh, new uh, function will work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sinha, for joining us. Now, to start off with, how many stores are there? And uh, you are doing this with red tape. So will these stores be stocking only red tape merchandise? Yeah, so uh, the first, uh, there, within a month's period, uh, we should be going live with around 10 to 12 stores. And all of these stores are red tape stores because these are in partnership with red tape. So they will have the products of red tape and also a few of the other partner brands whom, who, are, uh, who are actually targeted at the same target audience as the red tape stores. So while primarily it will be red tape products which will be there in the stores, uh, there will be other related products also available on the app uh, through the QR code that is placed at the red tape store. And uh, where will the first set of stores be, Mr. Sinha? Yeah, so uh, to begin with, there are few stores in Delhi, around uh, four, to, four to five stores. Uh, there are a few stores in places like Ambala, Kanpur, uh, Zirakpur out of, uh, outside Chandigarh, uh, one in Bangalore, one in uh, Kerala, in mostly in Cochin, and a couple of them in Bombay. So quite a mix of uh, cities, if you look at it that way, right from uh, large uh, cities like Delhi, NCR, and Bangalore, and Mumbai to actually third tier, tier two, tier three towns like um, uh, your Zirakpur, Ambala, Kanpur, and some other places. Well, thanks so much for joining us on Primetime, Mr. Sinha. Now, moving on, Indians are eating more cheese than ever before, and India's top dairy companies are looking to cash in on this opportunity. Let's have a look. Indians are not known to be big cheese eaters. The cheese market makes up just 1% of India's market. But it's the second fastest growing segment in the industry as a whole. As more Indians shift to a protein-heavy diet, the cheese segment is clocking an annualized growth rate of 13%. Not surprisingly, India's largest dairy player, Amul, has taken notice and decided to cash in. Amul is looking to double its capacity over the next two years as consumption habits of the Indian consumer change. Right now, we are expanding maximum capacity is one is the cheese. Last two years, we have trebled our three times capacity and next two years again, we are doubling. Okay. So you can say that within five years, our capacity in cheese will multiply by six times. Parag Milk Food, which holds a 32% market share, too has seen the demand pick up from hotels, restaurants and retail stores. The company has already increased its cheese processing capacity from 40 to 60 tons a day and that could very well go higher given the robust demand. The Indian cheese market is expected to reach 3,500 crore by the end of 2018 and with demand only going one way. With Indian food getting cheesier remixes everywhere, dairy companies are looking on tapping on this increasing cheese demand. So does that mean that there will be more cheese balls? This is Charlene D'Souza for Bloomberg Quint. Well, U.S. consumer price inflation exceeded projections in January. A rise in apparel costs prompted the spike in inflation. The data has sent treasuries and stocks stumbling as it added to concerns about an inflation pickup that may have roiled financial markets this month, excluding a volatile food and energy costs. The so-called core gauge increased by 0.3%, also above forecast for 0.2%. It was up 1.8% from a year earlier, higher than the 1.7% estimate. And U.S. markets are trading with losses uh, after the inflation data uh, is uh, out. Uh, the Dow has uh, dropped nearly a half a percent, with the S&P 500 also about half percent down. Uh, the Nasdaq flat, but in the green so far. Well, European markets reverse gains after the release of U.S. inflation data. They were trading with sharp gains ahead of the data on your screens. You can see that, which has fueled fears of an uptick in inflation. Well, that's all the time we have on Prime Time. But uh, up on Prime Time debate, we're going to talk about the RBI's new framework, which uh, came out uh, late Monday evening. A lot of tough rules makes it tougher to hide NPAs, uh, is it a bitter pill that the Indian banking system is ready to follow? That's the first debate tonight on Primetime Debate. Uh, we're also going to talk about the budget. 
on the show this evening. Well, why the budget? That's because uh, there is an amendment proposed in the finance bill uh, which effectively um, puts a cover on all the foreign company financing that political parties have enjoyed since 1976. That's how back the advantage goes. Uh, why should political parties be given this veil of secrecy when all of us are expected to be transparent? That's what we're going to talk about as well on Primetime Debate.